Good morning. Looks like we don't quite, I see your cat, cute. Um, looks like we don't quite have a quorum yet. So we'll give it a few minutes um, and hopefully we'll get one more SubTac member soon. All right, good morning all. It looks like we do have a quorum. Uh, looks like we have four of our five SubTAC members. Just wanna remind everyone we are broadcasting live. Um, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order at 8.03. And uh, Secretary Reyes, can we have a roll call please? Yes, um, Santa Rosa Water. Here. City of Katati. Here. City of Runner Park. Here. Sonoma Water. Sonoma Water. City of Sebastopol. City of Sebastopol. Okay, so it looks like we have three member three. Uh, looks like we have three present. <laughs> we still have a quorum. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, we'll see if uh, we'll see if Sonoma Water can join back. Looks like they dropped off. Um, I just want to remind the committee members: um, if you can, please mute your uh, phones and microphones when you're not speaking. That'll help make this broadcast a little more clear. Um, and so now we are on to uh, minutes approval. Anyone want to make a motion? Move to approve. Uh, Craig Scott, City of Katati. We have a move from uh, Katati. Uh, Mary Grace Crossford, Motor Park, second. Great. We have a motion uh, from Katati and a second from Roanert Park. Um, and now we'll take public comment. So we are now taking public comments we'll on minutes this. approval. I'm sorry. Uh, we are now taking public comments on the minutes approval. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail public comments? We have none. All right. All right. Uh, Secretary Reyes, can you please do a roll call vote? 
Uh, Santa Rosa Water? Uh, yes. City of Katati? Yes. City of Ronert Park? Yes. Sonoma Water? City of Sebastopol? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like we the minutes were approved with uh, four yeses and one absence. Um, Jennifer? Yes. Um, can I read out the staff present on the call? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please do. Um, let's see. Andrew Allen, Brian Boken, Emma Walton, Janine, Joe Schiavone, John Stinson, Kimberly Zunino, Lori Urbanic, Nick Harvey, Roberta Asa, Sean McNeil, Tana, Tanya Makovitz, and Zachary Kay. And there's also Vanessa Garrett. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So now we'll move on to item three. Uh, any announcements? All right. I'm now present. Sonoma Water is now present. So, hello. Hi, Joe. And uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, Henry Micus retired at the end of uh, January. And so I'm going to be filling in for uh, Sebastopol until they replace him. All right. Well, welcome, Joe. Um, so I guess that would qualify as an announcement. So um, we should probably take public comment. So we are now taking public comment on announcements. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail public comments on this item? We have none. Thank you. And so now item number four, public comment. <laughs> We are now taking public comments on item four. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail public comments? We have none. Great, thank you. All right, now we'll get on to the, the new business. So um, item 5.1 will be our presentation of the preliminary fiscal year 2021-22 O&M debt service and CIP budget and allocations. And we'll have Kimberly Zanino, our Deputy Director of Water Administration, and Lori Urbanic, our Deputy Director of Engineering Resources, making the presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Right, is that working for everybody? They can all see that? Great, okay. So we are here today to talk about um, the fiscal year 2021-22 budget. We will get right into it. Uh, so as an overview, we'll talk about annual flows. Um, this is not new to most of you. Our O&M expenditures, our miscellaneous revenues, uh, we'll talk about CIP, which I'm sorry is not listed in the overview, and then allocations and the budget schedule. Uh, oops, sorry, there's a there's an extra little piece in there, which I apologize for. Sorry about that. But this is just showing you uh, the annual flows year over year, and then the annual flows for 1920, which this year's budget is based on for O&M expenditures. Uh, and that's in that 2019-20 column, which um, those percentages per each partner are listed here. I'll fix that, and I will send this presentation out after uh, the meeting as well. So this uh, is the list of expenditures rolled up. You see these every year um, that show you where our increases and decreases are. Um, you are going to see some, um, some increases, which we'll talk about, but also some decreases that we've made uh, to cover those. 
These uncategorized items here, which are the first line item, are actually O&M maintenance projects. Uh, and so those are increasing, and I'll talk about why they're increasing um, as we go through the presentation. Professional services are also increasing. So I have another slide that talks about that. Um, but we have made as many adjustments as we can to reduce those as well as reducing, you can see here, the total indirect costs by um, bringing down the uh, overhead that is distributed to the regional partners uh, fairly significantly. So first, our main budget drivers. Um, as we all um, were aware, we uh, secured a $70 million bond last year for the replacement of the UV project. Um, that bond was very successful for us, luckily. Uh, and so instead of having what we had expected, which was about $3 million of an increase in debt service, debt service only increased by $2.1 million. Um, on the professional services, which was that line item that you saw increasing. Um, I think you're all mostly, most of all of you, uh, maybe not Sevastopol, but we have an agreement now with LizTech. Um, that agreement was put into place so that we could decommission the biosolids composting facility. Um, while we see an increase um, in this year's budget, over the next 20 years, that change from using our own facility uh, will save us about $8.7 million. And it will also have a significant reduction in um, O&M, or I'm sorry, CIP expenditures moving forward because that facility was in need of some extremely large repairs and was degrading quickly. Uh, for O&M projects, uh, you saw an increase in that line item. Um, that line item is increasing significantly, and that's due to a couple factors. The combination of the aging UV system, which we just got the bond to replace, so um, those O&M projects should go away in the next couple of years when that, that project is complete, uh, and also new compliance issues. But because it's aging and because of new compliance requirements, um, there is more uh, maintenance that is going to be required throughout this next coming fiscal year on that system. Uh, the other item is um, our CHP engines and generators, uh, which are due for their 24,000 hour service. Um, this is comes at uh, a $230,000 price tag, unfortunately, but we, we cannot suggest delaying this project um, as we have been seeing over the years, delaying some of these maintenance or delaying projects is costing us more in those O&M expenditures because we're ending up with emergency projects that are coming up um, during each one of these years. So budget reductions. Um, Kimberly, before yes. we leave, could we go to the previous slide? Sure. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the numbers. The UV bond is $2,133,000, correct? That's the total increase, correct? Correct, a annually. Um, yes, about, so it's going to be, it changes a little year over year, but that's about, okay. the, about okay. the but it's it, it so so that first line should have a uh, another three zeros behind it. Correct. Sorry. The, sorry. Okay. Yes, I should have put an M or three zeros on it. Correct. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely not two thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars. Okay. The, the list at contract is a little over a million dollars annually. Correct. Okay. The UV system maintenance is four hundred twenty-seven thousand five hundred, and the generators are 230,000. I'm sorry, it was just losing those zeros on the top line. I did not yeah. understand the order of magnitude we were talking about here. Yeah. Thank you. I will fix that as well for you before I send the presentation out. Yeah, thank, thank you for humoring me on that. Sure, no problem. So while we all know we're in a really rough year, what we did is we tried to reduce uh, budget expenditures as much as we possibly could on the O&M side. Um, so originally with some additional O&M projects that we are going to defer, um, we brought down the uh, O&M budget from 9.8% to 1.6%. So some of the things we did is, as you saw, there was a very significant reduction in the overhead charge or the, um, I, sorry, I can't remember the name on the line item, but it's overhead that's distributed between our funds. Um, we have done as much redistribution of that as we can between water, wastewater, and subregional. So that brought it down by a significant number, almost uh, $800,000. Uh, 
uh, and we reduced O&M maintenance projects. As I mentioned, we, we looked at any that we could um, possibly move out and we did that. Um, we also reduced the professional services line item. Originally, that was much higher. Um, the reason that we um, are reducing that or the way that we are reducing that is uh, with new permit requirements, um, we are going to delay some of the funding for that. Um, one of the most significant reductions comes from the money that we're building up for phosphorus credits. We need to be prepared in the future for um, working on a project that will allow us to build additional phosphorus credits, which is uh, probably gonna be a very expensive project. And so that's one of the areas where we reduced. So overall, we were able to reduce uh, in all categories, CIP, the debt service and O&M from an 11% increase for the entire um, expenditures down to 6.5%. And now before I go into all the allocations, we'll talk about CIP first. Um, it, you will have seen on your agendas that we did attach the five-year CIP funding sheet so that you are able to um, look at what is being proposed for funding in year one and then the plan for the next five years. Um, if you have any questions about any of those projects on those sheets, please let us know and we will um, follow up and answer any of those. But for the CIP portion, I'm actually gonna hand this over to Lori Urbanic. And then she, um, Lori, if you just tell me next, I will advance the slides for you. Did you have another question, Mary Grace? Okay. Okay, thank you, Kimberly. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all again. Um, first of all, so, you know, we did hear that there were concerns and everyone's having a, a really rough year with their budgets given the COVID. Um, I was, uh, just as a side note, happy to see the paper and hear that the, uh, that the Federal Relief Act was passed uh, yesterday and funding is coming to Sonoma County and to many of our organizations. So um, I hope uh, we have a brighter future this coming year. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the 20 year plan just to bring some perspective to where we are with our budget and where we are with project need. Um, Kimberly, if you can advance this slide, please. Some of you may recall this particular slide um, from last year's CIP. Uh, Deputy Director Emma Walton presented this. And um, this is a, a 20 year spending plan for CIP. Um, it was based on the, the sub regional master plan that was um, put out in 2018. Um, the actual projects were um, budgeted or estimated in 2017. So I just wanted to refresh everyone's memory that that was there. And um, I also recognize that Emma and uh, the deputy director, uh, Joe Schwal at that time, did scrub the projects that were presented in the master plan and try to develop um, a, a better idea of what that would look like uh, moving forward. Um, the takeaway that I want everyone to kind of reflect on right here is that you know, it shows some five-year average lines, a 10-year, 20-year average line, and the five-year line shows that it's $9 million kind of on a year-to-year -year for the first five years, and so we're doing pretty good. The out years, you can see, um, not so well, and um, so our need is growing in the future. Next slide, Kimberly. Thank you. So I thought I would present the, the same project information in a slightly different way, um, just so everyone has perspective on um, the overall need and where we are. So this particular plan shows the same information. However, um, I did apply a 3% escalation for inflation, both on our funding and um, our funding plan and our improvement plan um, costs. Um, the graphs look pretty identical as they as you would expect them to. The first five years up through 24, 25, you know, we're barely keeping up, but we're we're doing okay. Um, but as we move out into the out years, you can see that, you know, again, we're gonna have this large need. And um, I don't want everyone to focus too much on this exact plan because things change year to year. 
the relationship that I want everyone to have in their mind is that we're we're not spending enough and the funding need is con is going to continue to grow over over time. Um, I did select the the 3% from the Bay Area CPI um, in some analysis. We see that that has been staying around 3%. It, it'll jump up plus or minus a tenth or two on, on either side of that. But this does show a $1 million increase until we get to the 12 million and then the 3% um, escalator is added um, from then on out. Next slide. And again, same information, just presented slightly different. This is presented as a 20 year average. Um, so you can really see the discrepancy um, if we apply it. So across the 20 years, and it's like all of us know who have a 401k, we wish we'd spent more money early on and uh, reap the benefits of time. Um, when we're looking at um, our CIP and the need for our capital improvement program, time's really not on our side. So it's a race against time. And I just, I just can't emphasize enough how much we really need to stay on our spending plan, but recognize that we are continuing to fall behind. And it's, it's not just unique to um, our organization. Um, I'm sure all the engineers who, who read the report card that comes out every now and then uh, understands that infrastructure is a huge need across um, our organization, state and uh, the country. Um, so, unless there are any questions about this information, I'd like to turn it over to Tanya Mokvitz, who is our um, regional reuse engineer, to highlight a couple of the um, important CIP projects that are in this year's budget. Actually, I had a couple questions, if I if I could. Of course. Um, yeah. Thanks, and thank you for this information. Um, and and just. To, <clears throat> So I'm 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 sure. So um, so Kimberly, we are every year adding a million dollars to the capital replacement. Correct. I mean that's what we've been on that plan for quite a while. I think. And correct. We're still, and, and so I, we I just, believe the plan is to get to twelve. Okay. And and then we go to a three percent inflator at that point. Yeah. I mean I I think when we started this a while ago, it, as as I recall. You know, we had talked about getting to your to your rated depreciation, your annual depreciation cost, which I thought was closer to twenty million, um, which seems to kind of coincide with what Lori's showing here uh, to an extent. It would put it, you know, still a little bit behind, but um, I I would I guess advocate or want us for consideration to um, keep have that annual increase in CIP um, continuing until we, you know, by a million a year until you get to the point to where you're at least funding depreciation at a minimum. Otherwise, I mean, that's, it's not only are we, I think we, I, I think there's, um, let's see. And so Lori, I have a question for you. The, the CIP, this includes equipment replacement? Yes. So this is also somewhat of an indicator of depreciation as, as assets are wearing out, you're having to replace them. So, um, and, and, and I thought, and, and I recall your, the, again, I thought the annual depreciation right now is between 15 and 20, somewhere in that range. And so it, it just seems like it makes sense to continue this program of increasing the CIP by a million dollars every year until you reach the, at least reach the, the rate of the, the depreciation rate, because I mean, otherwise, as you know, we're, you're, we're essentially just borrowing against the, the assets. So, and we try to do that with our water transmission system too, <laughs> um, when we can. So, um, but, uh, but that's just something I, I would I would ask for, you know, it's submit for consideration that it, it shouldn't stop at 12 million. And I think your your chart shows that. 
So that's one thing. The other thing going back, Lori, I'm sorry to Kimberly and we can, and if you want, you can, we can address this offline. I would be curious to understand what um, the overhead, what your, your effective overhead rate is for this system and, you know, and for all of your systems. Um, we're, we're embarking on our own at Sonoma Water, our own internal analysis of that. And it would be great to have, to be able to compare. For projects? Uh, no, just your overhead for your the system as a whole. You mentioned okay. that you reduced overhead, I think, yes. by nine hundred thousand. If I think eight or nine hundred thousand yep. earlier in your presentation, so I would just be curious to see what percentage overhead is of your overall services and supplies, um, and likewise for your other enterprise. That's something uh, Lynn Roselli and I are um, uh, are kind of deep in conversation on, and and really looking at that at Sonoma Water as well and trying to get overhead under control. So um, overhead in that line item is actually the internal costs of the city and the water department that are distributed right. out between all the funds. So exactly. yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy yep. to kind of dig into that and, and get yeah. information on it. That'd be great. Yeah, and again, maybe it might be worth, I'll, I'll check with Lynn and I know it's a slightly bit off topic, but not all that much. Um, but yeah, I'd like to maybe set up a phone call with you in the next week or so. It'd be great. To, to go through that, but thank you. Uh, Lori? Yes. Long time no see. I know, Joe, nice to see you. It's <laughs> um, been this, a while. Yeah. <laughs> this chart, um, showing the averages is kind of skewed because you've got big numbers in the out years. Yeah. If you back up about uh, two slides, uh, it shows that we're, we're a little closer to holding our head above the water for the next 10 or 15, 10 years or so. But then what happens in 2035 that causes that big jump in CIP need? So what we're contemplating is a couple of new big projects. Um, it has to do with um, some increase in uh, ponds. So um, I always look at the 20 year outlook as kind of a, a difficult um, measure, but um, the master plan was contemplating a replacement of, um, or the addition of ponds and um, the other big expenditure I believe is, um, Let's see, I apologize. I should have been, had these projects better in my head. So if there's someone on the line that has it better in their head, um, I'd welcome that. But it has to do mostly with um, increasing our pond capacity, our storage capacity and the reclamation system replacement, all that piping. So, so some of it is like uh, Mike was talking about uh, depreciation and some of it is true CIP with uh, expansion of the system. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, Joe, what, what's not on this 20 year horizon, um, because we're just now embarking on construction of the UV this year, is that the life cycle on the UV, unless there's new technology that you know replaces UV for us, we're, we're gonna need to look at that replacement also in those out years um, that's a little bit beyond this forecast. So we do have major projects that are coming up in the future and we also have all the challenges that um, are unknown still. So actually project planning on a that far out, I just wanna keep it on our horizon, but things can vary year to year. Um, one of the big projects in this year's CIP that wasn't contemplated in the master plan is our aeration system. Our manifold and header is completely corroded and now we have an urgent need to get that project um, going as soon as possible. Yeah. So I don't, we're we're all kind of in the same boat. Every time uh, Sacramento meets, our costs go up. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but given those uh, big numbers in the out years, um, you know, it, it's uh, early to plan on this. But I would suggest that that's a real good candidate for bond funding. Yes, of course, and and that's what we probably would anticipate with those large uh, projects, just like we're bond funding UV. So those bond funding, as you can see, I didn't show that, but so those 
those dollars, like this year's bond fund, are not shown in this expenditure plan because I'm just trying to highlight the, the cash. Um, but yeah, bonding and you know the organization has done a great job um, with our bonds. And this year was selling them back and doing that refinancing was, um, as Kimberly has said many times, was very successful. Yeah, it, it's a good time to be selling bonds right now. Yeah. Really good time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think Priscilla, we need to bring Tanya up. There she is. I'm here. Uh, good morning, all, and thank you very much for your attention. I'm Tanya Mokowitz, water use engineer with water department, and I will go over the next few slides. So over the last years, asset management team has been working together with regional operations staff and based on their input, our master plan and risk of failure analysis, we have identified CAP funding needs. I'm not going to go over uh, every project on a CAP budget sheet. I will just highlight most notable projects. So the first one that I would like to highlight is from our um, master plan is emergency generator fuel tank replacement project. So this project is critical for um, for us and we've been actively working on over the last years. So we funded engineering evaluation and design effort por uh, portion of the project last year. And this year we are funding construction portion of the project. So this project will replace the existing underground uh, 15,000 gallon diesel fuel tank that serves our two emergency generators with the above ground 20,000 gallon tank. The existing tank exhibits sides of the deformation and is undersized for increased generators demand due to higher frequencies of PSPS. Also as part of those efforts, uh, we will install gasoline uh, fuel stanchion at treatment plant. Um, next slide, please. Um, the next important project uh, that I'd like to point out is Laguna Treatment Plant Electrical Infrastructure Replacement. This project is critical to the plant and also was identified in master plan. It will evaluate the complete electrical system of the plant and the project objective is to maintain and improve our electrical infrastructure reliability as part of the evaluation process, we will develop a structured maintenance program. We will also develop a list of CAP projects with priorities, costs, and schedule while utilizing condition assessment to quantify the probability of failure among them, along with consequences of failure. We will also update our 2016 Power Master Plan. Uh, similar to emergency generator project, we funded engineering evaluation efforts portion last year. This year, we're funding construction of critical electrical improvements projects that will need our attention sooner than later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next project that I would like to bring your attention is aeration basins and aeration header improvements that Lori just mentioned. It represents one of our new projects that was recently identified as a super critical and urgent. Uh, treatment plant staff discovered that the low pressure air duct that conveys process air between the blower building and aeration basins is leaking. The existing pipe was installed in 1994 and is about 15 feet deep. The blue dash line on the left picture, I hope it's visible, um, it shows approximate location of the underground pipe between the lower building and aeration basin. So the pipe is in danger of collapsing due to the uh, poor structural integrity and heavy soil loads. Maintenance staff also noticed that corrosion damage and air leakage are present at many of the above grade air valves, 
where piping routes air to submerged diffusers inside the aeration basins uh, with cracks up to 116 inch wide. The picture on the right shows an example of that corrosion. So this project would replace underground low pressure air duct. It will also evaluate and replace all aeration basins, low pressure pipes, fittings, and valves. Due to emergency and criticality of this project, we are looking at alternative project delivery method. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I will briefly go over maintenance building roof improvements project, which is another ur urgent project that was identified recently. Our maintenance staff discovered le leaks in the roof over the equipment in the maintenance building. Um, our CAP team is currently working with a contractor on the quote to temporarily repair the roof. We're expecting the project cost to be in the neighborhood of approximately 300,000. The temporary repair will extend the roof life for the, at least five years, which will give us time to fund, design, and construct a permanent roof replacement. So this will conclude uh, my portion of the presentation, uh, but before we move forward to the next slides, in the presentation, I would like to echo Lori's message and point out that new maintenance projects are increasing every year due to our aging infrastructure. Those projects, if we do not address them in a timely manner, over time are becoming urgent projects. Also, it's important to note that we need to continue funding our CAP contingency funds. So when urgent projects arise, we have funding to complete them and in order to avoid potential catastrophic failures. Um, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna take it back over and go back to um, our um, financial portion of the presentation. Um, as we look at each year, um, we estimate what the re miscellaneous revenues will be that come directly into the sub-regional fund. Um, we are decreasing them just slightly this year. Uh, we have a um, large um, hauler that has stopped um, trucking waste to us. They actually, I don't want to call out the hauler, but um, they actually uh, decreased their trucking. They also, we think, had a problem with their on-site treatment. And so now they've increased it again. So it's kind of been going up and down, but we've also received um, information that we will be receiving more trucked waste from another, um, another facility over the next few years while they develop theirs um, on-site. And then I'm not gonna take away um, Sean's good news, but he's going to be actually discussing in his portion of the presentation um, our efforts that we're going to start making to uh, even increase that program some to bring more revenue in um, for our uh, for the sub-regional fund. Every year we look at this slide, it is the total operating expenditures, uh, the capital improvement cash funding. Um, as operations expenditures go up, we have to keep that at 15%. So that next line item of 31,000 is just an increase to the operating reserve. Uh, then down near the bottom, we remove the revenue before we um, distribute the expenditures for allocation. And so that bottom line is the 39,899 is both the O&M and the um, CIP funding. So as I mentioned before, we got the total increase um, of expenditures down to 6.5%. Obviously it's different for each partner depending on their flow and how their flow was projected and what the actual flows end up being um, or how they've increased over the years or decreased. Um, but we are suggesting this year um, to apply some fund balance. So to bring that down for everybody, um, we have some um, funding in the refund reserve uh, and if we are to apply that refund reserve, I just have it, I just came up with one number here. And the number I came up with to try to get our, our um, increases down to 4% was 1.5 million. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you where the refund um, reserve sits. Uh, and then I also, before we go to the schedule, 
um, have set up a spreadsheet so that if we want to, as a group on the fly, look at how different amounts of fund balance application will change those amounts of the increase as well. So we can just do that right here, or uh, we could also do that um, in the as one on one if anybody wants to get a hold of me and they want to do that um, just with with me singularly. I'm happy. I'm more than happy to do that. So do you want to sit on this one for a minute, or let me show you the fund, the amount of refund reserve that we have, and then we can go back to that. So um, we are building fund balance um, over the last couple of years. Unfortunately, we have um, not been fully staffed. Um, we do expect to see um, some unexpended budget again this year um, with the hiring freeze that happened here in Santa Rosa. Uh, we are pushing very hard to get those positions filled now um, because we do have revenue to cover that. Um, so hopefully that won't be an ongoing um, issue for us. Um, but you can see here, these are the balances. Um, Katati and Santa Rosa have been having discussions. Um, their, their balance has obviously been decreasing because their flows have been increasing. So we're working with them on that um, to, to work on how that fund balance would be applied. So as a reminder, I also just wanna remind you how the fund balance re refund reserve works. At the end of each year, actual flows um, are, are uh, used to true up the amount we projected as a flow rate. And so they true up the actual amount that each partner was responsible for first. Then when there are unexpended um, budget, that comes back as turn back to the entire um, fund, but it is distributed based on those actual flows to each of the partners. So this is where you see um, where we all sit right now. So, so we have some pretty good fund balances now sitting there. And if we go to, I can either go back to this slide and we can sit on this slide or I can open up the spreadsheet. And this is what I set up for us if we wanna take a look at it. So um, you can see these are the total O&M expenditures here on my spreadsheet. Uh, this is the miscellaneous revenues that get applied. So the total amount that's being distributed uh, for O&M is here. Um, and then this is, I have this set up now so that we can literally just change these numbers, apply more fund balance, and you can see where the increases land uh, as we manipulate those numbers. So I'm happy to go any direction. We can either, you know, just go back and look at the numbers or we can start looking at, you know, how to apply that fund balance. And also answer any questions that anybody might have. So I think um, we wanted to present this information, give everyone some time to look and think on it. We also heard you loud and clear from the last subtac meeting about um, you know, the concerns that we're all facing as a community with COVID. So we really looked at everything we could to um, reduce down um, in some cases, you know, some things maybe that um, um, would have been a little better if we kept some a little more o &M budget, but really wanted to recognize the needs of the community at this time. Uh, so we do think that looking at ways that we can apply the fund balance would be another option um, to really kind of help with that rate smoothing for all. And so in looking at it and trying to come out with some options, uh, our initial take was this 1.5 million application across the board and then applied from to each of the partners. Um, from Santa Rosa's perspective, we're comfortable with that, but we wanted to have that discussion with the partners. Uh, we also understand that this is a lot of information in this meeting. Our next meeting is not scheduled until April 1st, uh, which was when we do a recommendation. But if we, if the partners would like to, and this committee would like to uh, take some time and then have perhaps a meeting in between this meeting and April 1st, we're also happy to do that as well uh, to further discuss um, uh, sort of these ideas that we're putting forward today. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you for that. And, and Kimberly for the presentation. I, I would be one, I would really maybe prefer to, again, talk maybe with Kimberly um, 
offline on this. Um, and I want to check with Lynn. We we may not with South Park want to apply the um, the reserve just for the uh, based on the particular finances of of that of that system. Um, but that's something I'd like to check with Lynn with and to and maybe Kimberly to have a follow up call with you. It sounds like we have a few things to talk about. So yeah, I would appreciate. Um, maybe coming back to this in April myself. Other as a reminder, comments? sorry, as a reminder, we do have to get this to our board on April 1st um, okay. for preliminary approval and then to city council by the end of April um, okay. in order to have numbers for you by May 1st. So okay. um, we realize you know, with some things that happened in the city this year, we were on an extremely um, short timeline um, with some changes that happened in the city. We just didn't have the ability to get in and do our budgets until very late. So then are we looking at just checking for process, then we would need to meet as a group probably the last week of March? Somewhere yeah. in there, yeah. Okay, great. We can, we can um, have, uh, if Kimberly, if you just want to, finish the presentation unless, unless there's additional discussion at this point. Sounds like um, perhaps folks, you know, need a little time, which we thought would be, um, but we can kind of just show you the rest of the schedule and then we can sure. have further discussion as well. And, and actually, before we do that, Kimberly, <laughs> could you humor me again? Because I'm slow this morning. Sure. <laughs> um, so Roner Park has available to it 2 million seven hundred ninety five thousand nine hundred and seventy four dollars in applicable refund reserve correct we could choose to apply eight hundred fifty eight thousand seven hundred and fifty seven dollars of that this year and the rate increase we would see from sub-regional would be zero correct okay um and and that would be our toggles we could apply none of it to all of it and play with the rate increase on that Correct. Okay. And I can plug those numbers in here. That's the way the spreadsheet is set up any way you want. I mean, whatever I apply just then shows you where you end up. This was just a starting point. I said 1.5 million, or this is actually at the 2 million now, but yeah. um, I'm applying this total amount of fund balance based on the O&M flows, because that's what it would be covering as O&M expenditures. But yes, really? however okay. you, okay. however and you want to apply it. So you're, a, each, excuse me, go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say each entity can pick, kind of custom pick their own, um, you know, use of their own fund balance, I'm assuming. Correct. Yeah, thanks. So and I'm happy to send out this spreadsheet too, and then it's all set up for you, and you can play with the numbers in any way you That'd want. That'd be great. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. your two million is a starting point, equally applied, but we could end up at an ending point with unequal application of the fund balance because South Correct. Park is choosing to apply none, and Rona Park is choosing to apply a lot. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean the way the refund works the refund reserve unlike and since mike you already talked about sonoma water's budget i'll say <laughs> the way that sonoma water does it is they just apply fund balance because they have the control to apply that fund balance any way they choose to we as partners don't have that we need to agree how we're going to apply fund balance uh, and so for us it's a little bit different um, so i just picked i just picked some numbers so i could show you how it worked uh, but it's completely up to you. That's your money. If you wanted to just ask for the refund and stay at the total amount and then use that, you know, to make your payment every month, that's the, that's at your discretion. So that's your money to use basically. That, that, that seems more complicated than it needs to yeah, be. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't really work like a rate smoothing tool. If you just take it all back each year, which is I believe it was before my time in this position, but that's why it was set up that way to begin with. Yeah. It I was going to uh, echo what Mike said: is that uh, we don't need to apply uh, refunds uniformly across the system. Each partner agency can pick their own. So yeah, I'd appreciate uh, 
uh, looking at this spreadsheet and playing with it. And then uh, I'll talk with you offline about this, Kimberly. Thank you. Yep, I will. I will send this out from my email, so you all have my contact information, uh, and we can set up meetings if you want to talk one on one. If you want to electronically, let me know what you want to do. However, you want to handle it, that's great. All right. So here is the budget schedule. Um, we have already had one meeting with the budget subcommittee where we discussed this um, option of applying fund balance. Um, and they seemed fine with it. We didn't get any um, adverse comments back from them, but we still have two more meetings with them, um, at least from Santa Rosa's perspective of applying fund balance. Um, we will meet with the BPU on April 15th to do a recommendation to city council for our entire budget. Um, we will be meeting with city council on April 27th to do the preliminary budget approval for um, the sub-regional budget or the regional budget so that we can provide that information to you per the agreement before or at the beginning of May. Uh, and then our city council has their budget study sessions on May 11th and 12th, and then they adopt our budget on June 22nd. And with that, we're done with the presentation, but happy, as I said, to have any additional discussion or questions where we can take those offline. So I think there's a couple things we'd like to just get um, clear concurrence with the committee on. Um, one is uh, if you would like to, sounds like I'm, we're hearing uh, every partner would prefer to kind of take the spreadsheet and look at fund balance offline and then get back individually. Or if you would like us to look for a meeting between now and the April 1st meeting when we will be meeting again as a subtack to um, make an official recommendation on the budget. I'll be honest, Jennifer, I think we need both. Both? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we need some time to look at it this individually and I think it would serve the process well if we met one more time before voting. It'd probably be a short meeting, but it would yeah. confirm that, yeah, we, <laughs> we're really seeing what we hope to see. Yeah. I, I'll second Mary Grace's uh, proposition. Okay, so it sounds like we have a majority that would like to do both. So we will plan on that. We will have uh, Kimberly send that information out and then we will um, uh, we'll be pulling you guys very quickly to find a time uh, between now and April 1st for another subtac meeting. Um, okay. And and then at that time we'll also, you know, we, we recognize we gave you the um, CIP budget sheet um, uh, relatively late in this process. So you'll also have time to look at that and we can revisit that if you have any questions on any of the projects. Um, and then um, and then just wanted to see if there's uh, questions or discussion from any of the subtech members based on the presentation today. Craig. The O&M budget went up by uh, just a little bit, it, it relatively is like 1.6% 1, 1. or so. And um, I had the, the reason for that explained to me as there's a lot of unfunded positions at the city right now. Uh, what does the budget moving forward assume in terms of those unfunded, uh, unfilled positions? Or, or Actually, or yeah. sorry. the 1.6 includes all those positions. Budget includes every position that we have budgeted for. Um, what, it, what we reduced were some of the O&M projects and the professional services um, agreements that are going forward and we reduced that overhead. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I suggest is that when, when you distribute all of this material, uh, you send us uh, Excel spreadsheets, not PDFs. The PDFs are kind of hard to play with. Both would be great too. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Other questions or discussion? Um, 
coming as the Santa Rosa rep. Um, uh, so we did go back and the best of our ability to recreate, because as you know, we've had a lot of changes in positions, um, was that it was a agreement by the subtac to increase uh, the CIP 1 million per year, year over year until it reached 12. But if you're hearing, if you all are saying there was a different decision, uh, we would happily um, take that uh, because as you know, we're continuing to look at that sort of funding gap. So um, perhaps that's something that we can revisit over the next year or so um, and kind of look and see uh, based on all your memories of being on the subtac, um, if there was a different different agreement, but the best we could tell from the minutes, it was just a, a, a decision at a meeting uh, many years ago and captured very lightly in the minutes. And and, and Jennifer, I, I think if back at that time, I think we were only doing 1 million a year. So, you know, we were looking out 10 years or 11 years and saying, well, let's take I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't question that's what we decided there. I'm just saying that it's now ten years later, and that we might want to relook at that. Um, Santa Rosa would absolutely agree with that. So um, uh, we'll look to bring that back over the yeah. next year uh, for additional discussions about our CIP investment. Any other questions or discussion on this item? from the subtac members. All right, if um, not. Um, Jennifer, we'll, oh, yes. before we leave this item, um, and, and again, this is long-term conversation, but for the first time in a long time, we may be seeing federal investment, significant federal investment coming into infrastructure. Have you all thought about how you'd utilize that to help manage some of these long-term needs? So it's a great question and it's something that we just um, started, you know, just got the information that there's potential opportunity. I think there's 36 million coming specifically to Santa Rosa. Um, part of that could be used for infrastructure investment, especially uh, calls out water and wastewater. Um, so um, we've had some initial discussions at um, the within the senior level of the city manager's report direct reports to to look at what options could be so it's definitely discussions we're having from that perspective i think we're looking at all opportunities of funding um, to help invest in our infrastructure um, whether it's specifically the regional treatment plant or our systems as a whole so yep thank you I will, as a reminder, to let everybody know that the flood wall grant that we went after, the federal flood wall grant that we went after is still in process um, and is actually in the environmental review. So that's very good news for us um, as regional partners. That could be a $10 million funding uh, that comes our way. All right, if no other discussion or question from the um, subtac members, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Um, so we are now taking public comment on item 5.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, and Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail com public comments on item 5.1? We have none. All right, great, thank you so much. So we'll now move on to item 5.2. And item 5.2 is gonna be an um, update on our regional operations division and Deputy Director of Regional Water Reuse Operations, Emma Walton will be making the presentation. Good morning. I'm um, sorry, I got cut off when I joined the meeting, so I'm not sure where we left off, but I assumed I've been uh, introduced. Um, I'm Emma Walton, I'm the deputy of uh, the regional operations. Um, I have a pretty brief update for you today. Um, Kimberly and Lori and Tanya did a great job um, communicating out kind of our, our infrastructure needs, and um, but I uh, so I really just wanted to focus today on where we stand um, with respect to our recycled water um, and, and the availability of recycled water coming into the um, 
to the irrigation season. Uh, so I'll be pretty brief today. Uh, Priscilla, next slide, please. Um, so as you are um, likely all aware, our recycled water production is tied very closely to rainfall. Um, and given that we have not had uh, much rainfall uh, this year, um, our current production is extremely low. Um, the gray line there shows our average production over the last about 35 years. Um, last year is shown in blue, um, just an important note. Last year's production uh, was our previous historic low um, for production um, over, over the records that we have. Um, and this year shown in black um, is even lower. Um, so we are producing very um, little recycled water, um, which basically impacts um, our ability to provide recycled water to our agricultural customers. So next slide, please. Uh, so you can see uh, our recycled water storage um, curve is shown here. Um, our average along the top there shown in gray and then um, the minimum that we've um, seen since the geysers has come online showed in the uh, dotted gray there. Um, and our current um, storage is, um, uh, as you can see, approaching uh, what we have ever, or the minimum that we have ever seen. Um, and this is not a minimum on any given year. This is actually the minimum on any given day over the last, um, or since 2004. Um, so we have uh, very little in storage. Um, also, I'll note that we have been um, since January about, or, or a little before that, been under delivering water um, to the geysers in order to um, retain some of our storage as we move into the irrigation season. Um, storage for us, allows us to have um, a lot more flexibility in how we manage our water um, and how much we're able to make available. Um, so we have been under delivering to the geysers. Um, and so this, the storage is a little more inflated um, than it would have been otherwise. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, this really impacts um, our uh, ability to provide water to our agricultural customers. Um, we have um, contracts with our urban and geysers customers um, that are uninterruptible and we have to meet. We are confident we will meet those contracts with the water that we are producing, um, but we will have to cut back pretty severely on the water that we provide to agriculture. So this year we are moving toward um, not providing water for our frost protection users. Um, that information has been shared um, with our frost protection users um, and we want to continue to share that message and get the message out um, because it will have pretty big impacts on, on operation for them. Um, we will be needing to look at allocations um, and we are in the process of establishing uh, what those allocations will be. They will be um, even lower than last year. Last year we were um, we, we, we needed to put allocations on our users um, of about 70% um, of their historical use. This year, it's going to be even more severe, um, extremely severe. Uh, so over the next few weeks, we'll be developing what those allocations will look like, and we'll be getting that message out as soon as we can. Uh, we have established an ad hoc of the Board of Public Utilities. Um, to meet this year and specifically discuss how we want to look at allocations, how we want um, to um, provide water to our agricultural users given we're in such dire um, conditions this year. Uh, so that'll be an ad hoc specifically dedicated to talking about um, how we allocate agricultural water um, just this irrigation season. Um, as I mentioned, we are under delivering to the geysers currently. Uh, we are confident that we will, by the end of the year, meet our geysers contract, uh, but just providing um, uh, the ability for us to maintain a little bit more in storage uh, does offer us some operational flexibility that's important. Um, we are cooperating with our regional partners. Windsor um, currently is uh, over delivering to the geysers um, to help offset what we have to deliver to the geysers. Um, to help us maintain just a little bit more. Um, Sonoma Water has also offered um, to transfer us 
um, some water, which we are gladly accepting. Um, so th those little bits um, are, are small in the grand scheme of things, but every little bit helps. And, and we're really appreciative and happy for the assistance. Um, and as we move through this kind of um, really dry year, we're gonna continue to communicate with our customers, with our board, with our regional partners um, about the situation we're in. Um, but so just wanted to kind of take an opportunity to again, um, emphasize what a, a, a tough year we're in for recycled water supply. And um, that's all I had, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, Emma, um, I also sit on the uh, Santa Rosa uh, Groundwater Advisory Committee and as we are making projections on future um, groundwater demands in the Santa Rosa Basin, um, they, we're counting more and more on reclaimed water to offset the demand from uh, local groundwater. And uh, I know that that requires building more storage. Uh, uh, we fought that battle back in 2000, and that's why we ended up with the geyser pipeline. But uh, and maybe this is a question for you, Jennifer. It, will there be a point where it would be prudent to renegotiate that geyser's contract? Um, so uh, that's that's a good question. Um, that would be something that both our city council and Calpine would have to have an interest in. Um, the geyser's contract really is a weather independent um, solution for us. It's critically important for us to not have to discharge. Um, we have looked at additional storage in the past. Um, we will revisit and continue to revisit storage, but typically, um, uh, you know, storage doesn't make a huge difference for us um, unless there's more water. Um, but the, the reliability of the geysers to keep us from discharging is critically important. So it's something we're gonna have to continue looking at and balancing, um, but we also have to, to keep in mind what the best value is for the sewer customers and those rate payers as well. Are there other subtack questions or comments? Yeah, just one quick comment, just for clarification. Um, I believe we, <clears throat> um, Sonoma Water has provided, I think, about 30 million gallons already from our airport Larkfield Wikiup. Uh, it's recycled water we're providing, and um, and uh, we, there may be a little bit more, but we're we're also kind of tight this year ourselves. So, but um, we are looking forward to. Uh, meeting with you and Emma, I think Kevin Booker is going to be trying to set up a meeting to chat with you about this to kind of develop a, an agreement by which we might be able to provide more water to you on a more regular basis. But um, anyways, I will, if he hasn't, you uh, be expecting a call from Kevin. I think this is a good time to be chatting. Yes, thank you. And yes, you are right. You guys have provided, I think, um, about 20 million gallons 20. Okay. so far. Um, we're happy to take more if you have it, and we're happy to continue to have conversations about how to, um, you know, uh, optimize the joint use as we move into the future. Right. Great. Thanks. Have you all done any climactic modeling on the recycled water system? Do, do we have an understanding of what the future looks like for your system? I'm not aware that uh, we have specifically on the recycled water system. So that is something that we will, uh, we need to start working on. Uh, and, and, and following up on Joe's point, um, is the context to start working on it, perhaps the groundwater sustainability agency? Because the, you know he, he's right. There's this really strong underlying assumption in the groundwater models that the recycled water is available to offset a lot of the ag demand. Um, and if that's not true, that really changes the way they're doing their planning. Um, yeah, and and and, and 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 you'd think we'd have that figured out by now, but 
you know, it, it seems like there's enough different people from agencies at these meetings that we don't quite get the dots connected. We've definitely been having those conversations. Um, so we definitely, you know, we, we have a seat at the, the GSA um, and the advisory committee and we have that information. Um, I think this is, this is a, the first year we've ever seen um, frankly, anything like this on our recycled water system. And so uh, we're, we're kind of trying to get, get through this as, as best we can and understand what those impacts are gonna be. And then we have to start looking at this going forward. So we do understand the need and, and looking on the GSA side, we also know we have to balance a number of different needs. And in particular for this group, for the subtac, we have to look at what's best for the treatment plant. So mm -hmm. it's a balance. I hear you, we're looking at it um, and it's gonna continue to be a struggle going forward. But this is, this is the first time, you know, these are historic lows. We've never seen anything like this. So we're trying to adjust and start figuring out what that means going forward and starting to look at these pieces yeah, from that and, perspective. And and I mean, the reason I suggest it is they've got a climate model all tuned up and running. So, you know, adding the precipitation volume on your ponds to that model and kind of seeing how it all overlays seems like it could be efficient. Very true. Famous last words with models. <laughs> <laughs> well, they ought to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think there's opportunities and synergies. I, I, I think we've said that from the beginning um, to work with the GSA and to look at GSA investment into um, uh, helping make recycled water more resilient. So I think there's opportunity there um, and, and not just for Santa Rosa system, but it's, it's impacting all systems yeah. that have recycled water. So I think, you know, with Windsor, with the airport, with um, us, uh, I think that, you know, the GSA really, uh, we, 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 we've brought that up before. Um, but maybe we need to bring it up more strongly uh, that there needs to be some look at how the GSA can help support as well. Um, yeah, I mean, they're recycle water resilient. They keep saying they're looking for projects. And if, you know, their whole plan is premised on resiliency we don't have in the recycled water system, that ought to be a very articulated discussion with some real projects and money on the table. Agreed. Yeah. And, uh, uh, just just to follow up on that, um, you know, Emma, you see the uh, current storage as a historic low uh, based on some of the climate models that we are seeing at the GSA that may not be the low for very long. We could see lower lows. And so, uh, Jennifer, what I'd suggest, what I, what I was getting at with uh, uh, the Geysers contract is that uh, Currently, you have a fixed quantity to deliver to the, uh, the geysers annually, and that that could be renegotiated to make uh, the geysers just another player on a par with uh, agriculture. And as flow, storage goes up, flows goes up. As storage goes down, sorry, geysers, you don't get that much water this month because you know they're players too. Yes, we've had we've had those discussions at this time. There's no interest by the city council or Calpine uh, to renegotiate the Geysers contract. It's a two hundred million dollar investment uh, that has been made by all of our communities and provides us with a lot of certainty. So um, we'll continue to work with our board and our council and get direction on that. But this is where we stand at this time. Okay, thank you. Other questions or discussion? Yeah, just, just it, this is going to be challenging. Yeah. When there's not enough water, the people with fixed contracts are very, very attached to them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for your time and yeah. uh, enjoy thank the rest you, of your day. Thank you, Emma. All right, so if there's no other sub-TAC uh, questions or comments, uh, we'll now take public comment on item 5.2. Um, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail public comments? We have none. Thank you. 
All right, that completes item 5.2. And so now we're moving on to item 5.3. And this will be a presentation of our trucked waste program and Deputy Director of Environmental Services, Sean McNeil will be making the presentation. Great, good, good morning, uh, regional TAC members. Excited to be here and share with you um, our trucked waste program. We'll give a little history of where we've been uh, with the trucked waste program, uh, talk a little bit about its mechanics and where we think it might be heading. So let me, um, I'm waiting to get the share screen, got that. Okay, so a brief history of our program is um, really was predominantly uh, taking in the landfill leachate prior, prior to 2006. We were getting about 10 to 20 trucks a day from uh, Meacham landfill uh, in the summer, and that would rise up to up to 70 trucks a day during heavy rains. And then in 2006, the pipeline connecting the Meacham landfill with uh, the treatment plant was completed and, and allowed to be in operation. And now much of that leachate comes to us through this pipeline. And, uh, and we also had a septic, we have a septic receiving station. One of the issues, whoops. Uh, one of the issues with the septic receiving station is our, our prices were a little bit out of alignment with what the market was. So we didn't have a lot. Um, we lowered the uh, people coming, bringing septic to us. We lowered the septic rate in 2015, which brought in more haulers uh, to the plant. And then soon after that, we uh, started our high strength waste operation uh, in 2016. Uh, it's limited to about 48,000 gallons per day, and it's uh, metered into the plant's existing anaerobic digester, so it wasn't an incredibly expensive project. We didn't need to create a lot of new infrastructure, but we did have to create some. And it's a low energy treatment option, so instead of mixing that in with our regular uh, waste, we're able to direct it straight into the, um, the digesters, and it increases our methane gas production. So the different types of waste that we accept, we have our septic receiving station, that's our highest rate. Uh, it's our highest strength waste as well. It's 13 cents per gallon to, to discharge there. We have our high strength waste uh, station, uh, that's four cents per gallon, and that's for animal processing waste, beverage process, processing waste. Uh, we'll take in fats, oils, and grease, and inedible kitchen grease. Um, as well as food processing liquids. It's really increased. It's been a, a great boon, I think, to our community uh, providing this service. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then we have our emergency holding basin. And this is where we take a quit, you know, sort of regular or low strength waste. Uh, and this is our equipment rinsate, groundwater and landfill leachate. Uh, that might come from some of the other landfills other than Meacham or if Meacham's pipeline is, is um, not in operation, then they would truck it uh, to this location. So that with this trucked waste program comes regulations as anything we do in the wastewater industry. Uh, so our, our NPDS permit requires that we have designated septage receiving locations. And so I just went over the three that we have. Uh, and then we, that we maintain a truck waste management plan, which includes a sampling plan and how we're managing truck waste and preventing the truck waste program from disrupting our um, operations. And so we maintain that. Also, uh, we have an air permit for this uh, through the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. When we uh, accept that high strength waste, we have a high strength odor scrubber uh, which, which prevents, uh, you know, fouling of the air. 
uh, and so we need to uh, monitor emissions from that as well. We have a renderer's permit, uh, which allows us to receive some of the material. Um, and with that comes a requirement that we track all the manifests for all of our kitchen grease transporters. Um, so uh, there's just some permits and regulations that we have to keep track of. We also need to uh, permit the waste haulers. So we don't just let anybody uh, discharge here. The, all the haulers need to be permitted. Uh, we collect an application and we update that application every year. That's something our Environmental Services Division does. Um, we collect an annual fee uh, for that uh, and we ensure that they have the appropriate insurance with indemnification uh, for the plant and uh, that we are able to sample their waste loads to make sure that it meets our criteria. Once they're permitted, they each vehicle uh, for each of the haulers, uh, so many haulers have more than one vehicle, will get a scan card. Um, and those scan cards are used and they track all the transactions and goes into our billing software. So over time, uh, the, this program has really grown. And if you look at the number of waste haulers, uh, we've had, you know, in 2012, we had one basically uh, uh, getting the le leachate from the landfill. Uh, and then that started to grow in 2015. Uh, towards the end of 2015, we changed the septage race from 27 cents a gallon to 13 cents per gallon. What was happening at that time is all of the septic haulers were uh, in our area were driving down to East Bay Mud. Um, and so that happened at the end of the year. And you can see in 2016, that number increased uh, quite a bit. And towards the end of 2016, we added the high strength waste uh, onto our uh, program. And then the numbers continued to grow uh, up to 40 do, 42 different uh, permitted waste haulers. Uh, one thing that these numbers don't show is in um, 2016, uh, where we had 25 waste haulers, we had 15, 50, 50 different trucks um, uh, permitted. Now uh, in 2020, we're up to 103 different trucks that are permitted to come in here into the treatment plant. So we could break it down into those three different areas. What is our, our volume of water that we've received in gallons uh, from 2013 to 2020? Uh, in 2013, it was almost all um, uh, the holding basin, which was leachate with 1,200 gallons of um, of septic uh, haulers brought in. So that's like four truckloads. Uh, 2014, uh, you know, once again, it was a wetter year. So our, our, the amount we came to our holding basin came up greater uh, in that um, the amount in a holding basin tends to vary uh, based on weather conditions. It'll rise in wet years because it's primarily leachate uh, and groundwater. Uh, and the septic uh, rate amounts uh, started uh, accruing quite a bit uh, starting in 2016 uh, and holding a uh, relatively steady between four to six million gallons uh, a year. Um, and then we can also just take a look at how this works with revenue because these, each of these waste streams have different um, uh, prices that they pay. And so since septic is the highest price, even though it might be the least volume, it's one of our higher revenue generators uh, for our truck waste program. And I just want to mention that the data here for the truck waste program is only that I'm showing is only what's trucked in. It does not include the uh, revenue that we get from the uh, Meacham landfill uh, through the uh, pipeline, which is what's in our budget includes that as well. So I just wanted to share that, that little bit of a difference. But you can see uh, throughout the um, time our revenue has grown. I think 2020 is a bit of an anomaly. Um, uh, Deputy Director Zinino was talking about in 2018, we had a boom year for our um, 
our high strength waist, it pretty much maxed out what we were able to, to do here for high strength waist. And that was because one hauler uh, had a big year for their brewery. Um, and then in 2019, it, it shrank. And then in 2020, they turned on their pre pre-treatment and are able to uh, find a new place uh, for that water to go that isn't our high strength waste. Uh, so we've seen a reduction um, in our high strength waste just from one haul or so. Um, what that really means is for our trucked waste program, variability is to be expected. Uh, overall, if you look at the trend, revenue has increased in this area quite a bit. Um, but the variability comes primarily from the leachate and groundwater sources are weather dependent and also new business opportunities can open and can close just as quickly. We have another um, opportunity, another business that's moving into our service area from out of our service area and they're bringing with them uh, different product lines um, each year and they're not gonna do pretreatment until all their product lines are here. So we're looking at that and uh, individual company uh, really taking over where we lost with that one brewery that this individual company moving in will increase it for a couple of years until all their lines are here and then they get their pretreatment in and they'll be able to use the sewering system that's in their uh, area and eventually will go to one of our regional partners as revenue. So it's a great opportunity for businesses, uh, us having this truck waste program makes it easier for them to relocate and phase in their operations into our area. So when we have a trucked waste program, uh, we have to have a sampling program and we have to sample new waste types so we can characterize it and know how to build them. Also, if we see questionable loads, which might be mixed loads, uh, we need to sample that and make sure that we're uh, both charging them appropriately and that they're discharging appropriately. Um, and so we have random sampling of septic trucks uh, at least two days a week. Um, and then our high strength waste program, uh, we sample up to three times per day as it's fed into the digester feed pipe. And this is really important as we accept new waste streams and when we're at really low flows to the plant because trucked waste, while it might seem like a, a relatively small amount overall, it can, um, if we get too much of a specific type of trucked waste, it could cause a, a disruption to our system. And um, so we need to keep eyes on that. But there are lots of benefits of our trucked waste program. And uh, if you just compare uh, the trucked waste program and its growth, that all that trucked waste would have been going somewhere else, primarily to East Bay Mud, uh, we can track the vehicle miles traveled uh, uh, of businesses being able to share that. And we're saving about 671,000 vehicle miles uh, per year with our trucked waste program, uh, which saves an annual 3,500 tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, not only does it help our businesses in our area, but it gives us an opportunity to um, make these services cheaper uh, by, because they don't have to haul so, so far. Um, it also has increased the amount of water reuse. So talking about having this water available for our reuse program is incredibly important and having a trucked waste program that brings that in. While it's a small part of the overall uh, water coming into the plant, uh, it is another part. And it's something that we've been able to do by increasing the trucked waste program. Um, also has increased the biosolids reuse um, and methane gas production because of that. So that methane gas production uh, turns into power uh, to help offset the cost of running our treatment plant uh, and also can inc increases our revenue. But, you know, with any business venture, it's not without its own um, impacts. Uh, so when we bring these trucks into our plant, they're big trucks and they're loaded. Uh, it's wear and tear on our pavement. We've had to add an additional operator to our shift to just oversee the truck waste 
uh, program and make sure that every time uh, we get a high strength waste connection, that's, that needs to be an operator who makes that connection. It also uh, has impacts to uh, our office staff because there's greater amount of tracking, including uh, the billing. Uh, you know, we have uh, four customers in the sub-regional program, and then now we have 42 other customers through our trucked waste program. Uh, so we have to keep track of that billing. And now with the inedible kitchen grease uh, program, we need to track the manifest. So we need to make sure that each trucker is giving us a manifest for each uh, load that they're discharging and that that manifest is, is tracked here at, at the city and then made available um, to, to regulators when they come in to double check that we're checking that. Um, we also have the increased biogas production, which increases the maintenance on our engines. And then, of course, the trucked waste program, because the sources of the, the trucked waste it is variable, it has a greater risk of plant upset if it's not monitored. And we did recently have uh, an issue of getting really low pH loads to the, to the plant that we had to send a trucker away. And re recently, we've had to work with another hauler uh, to make sure that they're uh, sort of limiting the amount of trucked waste that they bring because it has impacts to our UV transmittance uh, from that particular waste stream. So we need to keep an eye on this program. It's not just a um, let them dump uh, and assume it'll all be good. We have to keep monitoring. So in summary, our trucked waste program has um, provided 36,000 deliveries, over 36,000 deliveries between 2013 and 2020. Um, that's over 148 million gallons of water that came in and that uh, amounted to $6.9 million in revenue uh, and over 60,000 megawatts of power was generated um, from that. Well, where's it going? What's the future of the truck waste program? That's, that's um, that variability will continue. I think if we run a climate model uh, on this, uh, I think the future is greater amounts of variability, really wet years, really dry years. Um, but also there are new business opportunities. Uh, currently the regulations that are out there, and I'll speak a little bit about these, are, are um, could open up new opportunities for truck waste program. And that uh, because of our program and our automation of the billing and, and all the things that we've set up, uh, it can be an attractive option for businesses wanting to relocate into our service area and wanting to phase that in a way that fits with their business model. Um, and that what's really important to us for the future of this truck waste program is that we're able to effectively monitor these waste streams and to prevent treatment plant upset. Because if we can't do that, we can't do this program. So changes to the regulations. Uh, there's two that I can just think of recently. The pathogen TMDL, it's going to require greater amounts of septic tank inspecting, cleaning, and hauling throughout our region, um, which will mean uh, there'll be greater loads of that. That's um, an area where you know it's beneficial for us. We like this revenue stream because um, it does not typically provide a lot of upset. The trucks are relatively small compared to some of the other sources. Um, and so it has less wear and tear on the pavement and they pay a higher rate. And also uh, winery waste requirements. The regional board has just really, uh, or the state board has just changed the uh, general waste discharge requirements for winery process waste. And so we might start to see uh, wineries looking as part of their business model, instead of upgrading their systems, looking at our truck waste program uh, as an option. And of course, that's going to be an industry as they start to utilize our services more. We're going to need to work with and educate them about what is the um, water quality parameters that we can actually um, receive here, because some of this waste stream from wineries can be an extremely low pH and, and cause an upset in our plant. So with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions or comment or discussion from the subtech? 
Yeah, Sean, just uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, so when you sh showed the um, the extra, the, the energy production of 60,000 megawatt hours, is that attributable to the trucked waste or is that total? That's the trucked waste program from 2020. That's impressive. 2020. That's impressive. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, I'm just trying to think of, to do my conversion in my head real quick. I'm thinking, is that, is that a, a few hundred thousand dollars or a couple million dollars? I'm trying to think. I'm just, I, I just I don't pay the electric bill here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, um, I'm, 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 I'm rusty on that. So anyways, yeah. yeah, I think it actually, it's probably on the, in the order of, Oh, well, it's right. It's off. You get to use that to offset your purchases then, right? Right. Okay. So yeah, so that's, that's quite a bit. So that's, yeah. that's great to hear. Average about 15,000 a year. Yeah. Great. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I, I'm sorry. One more comment. Um, so the, you said there are, they're hauling, they haul in, for example, like grease trap material, right? Right. And that, so, and that's probably within your service area? Uh, that's, that's within the region. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. That was my yeah. question, if, if it's within the region. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we actually um, changed our sewer ordinance to actually to allow it to come from out of the county. Uh, prior to that, our sewer ordinance uh, wow. it had to be generated within the county. But with uh, all the disasters that have been happening and a need uh, and systems being shut down in other areas, we thought you know while we're not looking to get people from out of county, just having that flexibility in our sewer ordinance was important. Absolutely. So, okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank you all. Okay, take care. Thank you, Sean. So if there are no other questions or comments from the subtac, we'll now take public comment. Uh, we're now taking public comment on item 5.3. If you wish to make a public comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And then Secretary Reyes, do we have any live email or voicemail co public comments on item 5.3? We have none. All right, thank you. Well, that concludes our uh, new business. And so we are now adjourned. Thank you all, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.